Hi, I'm Alistair Aitchison. I'm an indie developer based in the UK, and I do a lot of work with custom controllers and local multiplayer games. Recently I've been playing around a lot with strange control systems for video games. This is a set of buttons I made for a game called Codex Bash, being used to play Sonic the Hedgehog 2 as a team. Each player has a button which does either left, right, down or jump, and every 30 seconds the role of each button changes, so the team has to communicate as they play in order to work out what they're doing. I'm fascinated by the idea of taking a game that already exists and finding a way to change it into a new strange experience, and this is what led me to explore emulation, and in particular making modifications to the emulators themselves. This led me to start experimenting with OpenEMU, an emulator for Mac which collects together a range of open source emulators. As an open source project, I was able to add my own functionality to edit the memory while the game was being played. I wanted to see how making unpredictable changes to old games could turn them into new experiences. Experiences which I hoped would be fun in their own right, but which would also encourage players to play them in a new way. What I came up with was networking two computers together, so that progress in one game would create glitches in the other. This is the story of how that project came together. The Sega Mega Drive, or Genesis in America, has three main bits of memory, the video RAM dealing with drawing sprites to the screen and managing colours, the work RAM which deals with game logic, for example the layouts of levels, character physics, and the Z80 processor which is the same processor as runs a Sega Master System, but in this case is usually used to work with sound. Virtual versions of these chips are written as program code in the emulator, so by changing that code I was able to twist how they worked. The first change I made was with video memory. 60 times a second, the emulator would now choose a random byte from video memory and change it to a new value. Sometimes effects intended for objects in the background would be used for objects in the foreground. Other times objects on the screen would enlarge, which I think is the Mega Drive switching into Master System mode, but sometimes the game would become completely unplayable because of these glitches. The Z80, which deals with sound and music, gives you 8 kilobytes that you can play with. In this example, I changed 100 values in the Z80's memory 30 times every second. After I stopped making the changes, some of the music and sound effects were still off. The puzzle game Puyo Puyo doesn't seem to use the Z80's memory at all. It seems to use the work memory for all of its audio. Changing random values in the work memory caused some really weird effects. Of course, the music is also defined by the contents of the cartridge. I was able to modify the contents of the cartridge while the game was running. In one instance, Sonic 2 produced this really interesting sound at the end of the level. When I made modifications to the contents of the cartridge, this meant that when I reset the game, the modifications would still be there. This created some really cool effects in Puyo Puyo. In this experiment, I chose 10 bytes on the cartridge every second and replaced them with random values.
I decided Sonic 2 was the most interesting to work with. It got a lot of really cool effects, but also seemed to remain largely playable even after it had been heavily modified. It's also been very well documented by fans, which means it was easy for me to find specific values in RAM to modify. In this example, I wrote random bytes of data into the part of memory used to store metablocks, the smaller blocks that the levels are made out of. In this example, I modified the cartridge data for the layout of the levels and the artwork for the blocks. Interestingly, this affected their collision detection too. With this modification, I was able to just scramble the artwork. The Metropolis Zone scrolls from top to bottom, which is cool because it means you can't fall out of the stage. However, most levels don't, and once you've scrambled a level enough for it to become unplayable, it's not going to change back. So, if I want to use this change of level layout but have it continue to be playful, I'm going to have to change the levels in memory because that's temporary. I added in functionality so that the emulator would detect every moment when the player collected a ring. Every time a ring is collected, the game will write a random value into the part of memory that deals with the large blocks of level. At the same time, sprite mappings for various objects in the levels will be changed. This is so the player knows that something weird has happened. It also changes the palettes for various items every time you do this, to give you the feeling that you are corrupting something, which adds to the spectacle. I also gave the player infinite lives and a reset button just in case they ended up in a location they couldn't get out of. You'll notice that some situations which used to be simple become very difficult. You're avoiding getting rings, but there's lots of locations where you'll have to run through rings whether you like it or not. These loop the loops in the chemical plant zone are absolutely deadly. You start to focus on getting to the next checkpoint, because every time you die, the level modifications are reset. The flow of play becomes more puzzle-like, challenging you to use the physics of Sonic to avoid collecting rings, and to get yourself out of sticky situations that weren't in the original game. I was particularly interested in the speedrunning aspect of the experience. What would it be like to get two people racing against each other in this version of Sonic 2, and having to make up solutions to problems that arose on the fly. Even better, what if there was some kind of interaction between the two players? So the next thing I started working on was adding a networking component. Now, whenever you collect a ring, instead of your game being affected by glitches, your opponent's game will be. The response from those players I got to test it has been fantastic. Players said it reminded them of urban legends of haunted cartridges, and it generates a lot of laughs. There's plenty of level layouts that feel like a cruel joke, but equally lots of moments when players overcome a seemingly impossible obstacle. I love those unexpected moments that feel entirely unique, because they were never designed into the game. So, where to next? Obviously, this is just the beginning, and there's a wealth of things to explore here. But I'm looking forward to getting this out and about, and hopefully turning it into some kind of installation or performance. So this shouldn't be the last you'll hear about this project. Watch this space. <laughs> you live there now. Look at the background. <laughs> um, I don't know where to go. This is not now. <laughs>